Dr. Small, what is your first memory of being interested in the subject of memory? Well, I think I got interested in it when I started studying Alzheimer's disease and geriatrics. When I got into the field of gerontology, I realized that one of the biggest problems we face is cognitive decline as we age, and Alzheimer's is the most common cause of that decline. But it turns out, before people get Alzheimer's disease, they have milder memory complaints, and there's just so much worry and concern among millions of people about these age-related memory slips and what we can do about them. So that's really how I got started. You mentioned in the book that memory can start decaying or getting worse even younger than we think. What uh, is one of the typical ages that memory loss can start to occur? Usually people begin to notice it in their 40s. And studies of neuropsychological testing, pencil and paper tests done on many, many research subjects has found that for the average 40-year-old, a decline in memory performance can be detected. However, we've done some recent studies collaborating with Gallup Poll where we find that people even in their early 20s begin to start complaining about their memory. Now, their complaints are probably different from those of somebody who's in their 70s, but still the methods we've developed for the book apply to people of all ages. So given this wide age range, is there a common, so to speak, anti-memory activity that people are engaging in every day? And if so, what are those things and how can they be uh, treated or how can people go about their daily activities differently so that they're honoring their memories and their brains? That's really what the book is about, and it takes the latest science of the brain, explains it in a way that people can understand, and then translates that science into practical strategies that people can begin using. And in the two-week program, we introduce them to these exercise and strat- exercises and strategies, and they gradually build up their mental strength and memory power over that two-week period, and it's just long enough for those exercises to become habit-forming. And it involves physical exercise, it involves mental stimulation, stress management, nutrition, and learning techniques to compensate for any age-related memory challenges people are experiencing. You mentioned a lot of different memory exercises in the book, and I'm wondering if you have a personal favorite out of them all that addresses some of the prevention of Alzheimer's and just longevity in general that you enjoy the most that you do yourself. Well, let me just clarify. I, I don't know that the memory exercises will prevent Alzheimer's, but I think that physical exercise very well may delay the onset of symptoms, as will general mental stimulation and proper diet, what the memory exercises will do is to compensate for the decline so people can have a stronger memory longer, even as their brains age. Now, if you look at all these different exercises, it really boils down to two methods that we we now call focus and frame. So we need to focus our attention because the biggest reason people don't remember is they're simply not paying attention. They're not getting the information into their brains. And frame is a shorthand for trying to frame the information, providing a framework so that it has meaning. If something is meaningful, it will become memorable. And we do that by using visual images. Our brains are hardwired to remember visually very effectively. So we can... Uh, take a very common memory complaint like names and faces, forgetting names and faces, and teach people how to create visual images to link the name to the face. So if you meet Mr. Foreman, you might notice he has a prominent forehead. And so you notice that distinguishing feature and that links it up with the name in a visual way. A lot of the memory exercises do involve some sort of visual imagination. And one thing I hear from a lot of people is that they're just not visual. They are maybe more auditory or kinesthetic or conceptual. 
Is there any advice that you would have for someone who feels that they don't have the visual capacities that a lot of these exercises seem to call for? That gets down to a common principle that we want to train and not strain our brains and try to cross-train the brain. So everybody has innate strengths and weaknesses. In areas that are weak, it may be visual skills. Those can be built up gradually. And areas that are strong, we can leverage those strengths to help us compensate better. So people who are better with auditory skills can say the name or word to themselves or think up a, a musical jingle that might help them remember something better. Now you mentioned in Two Weeks to a Younger Brain a few times Einstein's brain, and maybe you can describe that a little bit. And why doesn't everyone have a brain automatically like Einstein's brain? You know, I think that it's uh, a certain degree genetics, let's face it. I mean, some people are Einstein's at birth and others are not. And when they looked at Einstein's brain, remarkably, it looked very much like the average person's brain, except for this area called the corpus callosum, which is the connecting point between the right brain and the left brain. So what we might theorize is that... Uh, Professor Einstein was better able to process information quickly compared to the average person. But another point we make in the book is that genetics is only part of the story. And in fact, the MacArthur study of successful aging taught us that for the average person, non-genetic factors are more important to keeping your brain young. And that's why we emphasize all the simple things that people can do every day to get their brains to function better and their memory to be sharper. One of the interesting stories in the book is you talk about chiding your son for playing video games, and there's a bit of a surprising twist at the end of the story. So what's going on with video games and memory? Well, it's complicated, but, but we do devote a whole chapter to brain games and what people can do to use them effectively. And that, that was an incident where I was uh, annoyed by my son playing a, some kind of violent video game. And uh, I finally, you know, knowing that this kind of repetitive video game playing it may not be great for his developing brain, I shouted to him, Harry, get off that video game and come downstairs and watch television with me. And of course, I, I thought how ridiculous that sounded. But in my mind, I was thinking, we're watching a public television program, it's educational, we'll have a conversation. But what I didn't realize was that my son was playing the video games with his friends. So there was a conversation going on, and it was a social interaction. So I think our relationship with the new technology is very complex. In some ways, it can uh, cause wear and tear in our brains when we're spending too much time doing email or searching online, doing repetitive tasks. On the other hand, the technology actually augments our biological memory. We can pick and choose what we try to remember, like names and faces, uh, and socially that's very important, but we don't need to remember birth dates and appointments. We can use the programs for that, and we can look a lot of stuff up. In addition, there are new video games that actually train our brains. It can boost IQ or improve multitasking skills. So I'm very excited about the technology if we use it wisely and don't overuse it. Speaking of technology, there's something really interesting that you talk about that the brain has kind of a relationship to memory and information where it determine where the age of a memory somehow determines where it's located in the brain and that memories travel from one lobe to the next. And I kind of have this picture of sorting files through my computer and they, they move according to date and rearrange themselves. So what's, what's happening in this idea that memories age and then that determines where they are found in the, in the brain? Well, so the brain is a very complex organ and uh, there is a lot of neuroscience research understanding how memories are consolidated. Uh, we describe how there are very fleeting momentary memories, we call sensory memories, that we all experience from moment to moment, and we don't notice them. 
But if we pay attention or if there's an emotional component to the memory, it's more likely to be consolidated in, in an area called the hippocampus underneath the temples. And uh, once that happens, it is like an information highway. As the memory becomes stronger, as it becomes more long-term, it moves towards the front part of the brain very gradually. And they, they also reside throughout the brain, depending on the type of memory. If it's a visual memory, it will be in the back of the brain because that's where the visual cortex is. So it's a, it's quite an interesting phenomenon. And they actually, these memories, in a sense, live in neighborhoods, which explains why it's often difficult to remember some information. But when you're reminded of a neighboring memory, then the, the memory you're looking for comes back to you. Hmm, that's a very interesting metaphor. And given this neighborhood image, what, where do memories go when people are having, quote-unquote, senior moments? Well, they're not going anywhere there. <laughs> you know, it's a bit, their memory is really a very much like a filing cabinet. You have to file the information in the proper place and know where to pull it out. So when we can't find those memories, we're distracted by other memories. So we're a little bit mixed up in our filing system, and we need some help into into how to locate those files. And that's what a lot of the memory techniques we teach help us do. Well, heaven forbid that you were to lose your memory, but if that were to happen, is there one memory in particular that you would never want to lose if all, uh, all else was to disappear? Well, that's, you know, those are such tough questions. And I think, uh, to me, uh, you know, the memory I would not want to lose is the, the memory of the emotion of love. Because I think... That is so important to all of us. It's such a strong, compelling feeling, and it really draws people together, and it defines who we are as a species. I mean, humans are very social animals, and those positive emotions that we experience uh, really make life so worthwhile. Well, speaking of love, I really love Two Weeks to a Younger Brain and really <laughs> grateful and honored that you gave us the time to speak about your book for the audience of this podcast. What's coming up for you next? Next, actually, I'm uh, <laughs> in the short term, I'm doing a public lecture on the book uh, this afternoon, but I am continuing my research on memory and, and brain aging and uh, my wife and I are continuing to work on a monthly newsletter, the, the Mind Health, Dr. Gary Small's Mind Health Report, and we're putting our heads together for the next book. We haven't quite decided on what we're going to do, but it will probably be in the general area where our interests lie, and we're really looking forward to continuing uh, our work together. Great. Well, thank you again so much, and Two Weeks to a Younger Brain is such an excellent book, and I hope everybody listening goes out and gets it. And uh, have a great day. Thank you. Appreciate it. And this ends today's interview with Dr. Gary Small. I really want to thank him for being on the podcast. Absolutely incredible information, and I really, really highly recommend to you Two Weeks to a Younger Brain. I read a lot of books on memory improvement, as you know, and I found this to be one of the best that I've read in a very, very long time. And it's very, very valuable because it, again, as you heard, it talks not just about the idea that you're going to lose your memory when you're 40 and older. It talks about what you can be doing all along because we lose our memory or we start to feel the effects of memory diminishment at a much earlier age. And so you don't have to wait until midlife to use these techniques that he talks about, not just memory techniques, but other brain building and brain exercising techniques to maintain your vocabulary skills and maintain your critical thinking skills, maintain your creativity. And these are just really, really simple things that you can incorporate into your daily lifestyle habits and have greater brain health as a result. So you can rescue your brain in advance of it decaying and save your cognitive abilities for when you're really going to need them. You know, when you're young, you need your cognitive abilities, of course, to get through school, to get a great career rolling for yourself. But you want to be able to maintain them and even grow them over time because medical health is improving and we're living longer and that means that we're more susceptible to some of the 
dark sides of life, which we can prevent and even reverse brain aging. So really, really make the investment in this book. It's not an extraordinary cost. It's very, very reasonable. And I think that you would do yourself very well to read Two Weeks to a Younger Brain, no matter how old or young you are. So that's my big endorsement for Dr. Small's book. And I, again, really want to thank him for being on the show. And so this is Anthony Metivier signing off from the Magnetic Memory Method headquarters in Berlin from the Magnetic Memory Method podcast from magneticmemorymethod.com. And until next time, keep magnetic. <laughs>